Hello, human geographers. Tonight, we have our first lecture of our flipped classroom model. So just as a reminder, you guys are going to be watching these lectures at home using our digital platform. You're going to be taking notes on our note packet and answering any questions that pop up through the platform. And so that's how we're going to be doing this. I'll be able to check your progress. I'll be able to see how you're doing with questions. And then, of course, we'll check your notes in class as well. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Tonight, we are going to be talking about the Industrial Revolution, a pivotal moment in human history that has had a huge number of effects. And so that's why we're talking about it towards the beginning of the year so that we can understand it throughout all the rest of the units. And we're going to start tonight by looking at how did this Industrial Revolution begin. So we have to take a look at what we had before. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, there was what was known as the cottage industry. All right, Cottage industries were manufacturing systems that were based in the home rather than in a factory. And again, it was found before the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution is this series of improvements in industrial technology that transformed the way that we manufacture goods. And due to the Industrial Revolution, due to these improvements in technology, cottage industries, manufacturing in the home, began to shift to these large factories. And the hurt that's often associated with the Industrial Revolution is Northwest England, during the mid to late 1700s, 18th century. And the industry that is most affected early on is the textile industry, all right? Manufacturing cotton into cotton goods and things like that, all right? And there were two major developments that really helped to drive the Industrial Revolution. The first was greater access to capital. Now, capital is the monetary assets that a business possesses. Uh, in England, a lot of their capital, a lot of their wealth was generated by their position in global trade at the time. And they had a really dominant position because they had a really strong navy and things like that. And it got a lot of its resources from its colonies. So cotton shipped in from India and things like that. And so the second major development was not one but a, an entire series of technological improvements, of inventions that really work to raise manufacturing output, things like mechanical looms and the flying shuttle. Now, in addition to this, we also harness new forms of power as well. Human power gave way to other things like water power, the burning of fossil fuels, especially coal, and then later on, much later, electricity. So let's take a look at England at this time. And the first steps in industrialization occurred in northern England, where cotton from America and India was shipped to the port of Liverpool. And textile factories in the British Midlands, south of Manchester, took advantage of rivers and hills to power cotton spinning machines by water running downhill and especially around areas that had waterfalls and rapids, so good site characteristics that helped to generate power. This meant that manufacturing remained, especially early on, largely rural and quite dispersed. All right? They were tied to the landscape okay, where there were running water and things like that to power these big factories. Now, in Britain, as time progressed, areas around coal fields became more densely populated and then became highly urbanized. So we start to see things shift over time. And the coal, cotton, and textile plants that were located close to each other helped Liverpool, Manchester, and Leeds become the center of mechanized textile manufacturing during the Industrial Revolution. Now, this is a quick little article to check out regarding some of the innovations of the Industrial Revolution. 
And I would encourage you to check it out, especially if this is the first time you're hearing about this industrial revolution, you don't know as much about it. Um, it talks about some of the different inventions that, that took place. So, you know, uh, one of these inventors, his name was Jethro Tull. And before Jethro Tull was dropping sick flute solos, and if you don't get that reference, uh, ask your parents. And if they still don't get it, ask your grandparents. But before they were a 70s rock group, Jethro Tull was inventing agricultural inventions like the seed drill that helped to make agriculture production increase. Now, hands down, the one invention that we have to make sure that we know and are familiar with coming from the Industrial Revolution is the steam engine. So make sure if you write nothing else down, find a spot in your notes, mention that the steam engine, one of those major industrial inventions coming from the Industrial Revolution. Now, the invention of the steam engine provided a better source of power and allowed factories to move away from areas that were water powered. And then combine that with the invention of railroads, which again were driven by steam engines, and that lowered the cost of transporting bulky and heavy goods. So companies could move their manufacturing plants away from coal, away from iron ore deposits, and move into big cities. Cities like London and Paris. And cities were more suitable for these companies because they could draw from a huge labor pool and they could sell their goods to a much larger population of consumers. And London was especially attractive. Now London is in southern England. And London was especially attractive because its site was on the Thames River and its situation was especially prominent within the global flow of regional and global capital. And so it was especially important as a city, as a hub of economics, of politics, and now of industry. And all of these circumstances combined to create an explosion in urban populations everywhere that industrialization was taking place. And as cities grew, the old systems that had been in place for handling things like human waste, burying of the dead, and cleaning up after horses were overwhelmed. Air pollution actually increased to such a level that it was harmful, even deadly. And so one of the, the common misconceptions is that the Industrial Revolution happened overnight. But the reality is it was a long-term event. And in the long term, the death rates declined due to improvements in sanitation and inventions of things like soap and developments of new medicines. But in the short term, death rates actually went up due to high levels of pollution and just the dangers of factory life and inadequate sanitation systems. Now, it's important to note that colonialism was driven by the Industrial Revolution. And so on the right-hand side of your, your screen there, notice that increased demand and consumption contributed to colonialism. Now, colonies had already existed, all right, but it was driven by the Industrial Revolution and was one of the, uh, the, the effects of the Industrial Revolution. And so Colonies provided a lot of different things and, and provided other contributions to the economy of the, this industrial period. They provided things like raw materials such as sugar, cotton, foodstuffs, lumber, minerals that could be used in mills and factories. They provided labor to extract raw materials that could then be traded, transported to industrialized areas. They were markets where finished goods could be sold. They built ports where trading ships could stop and be resupplied. And these profits that came from these colonial areas then could be used to be invested in other factories, new factories, in the building of canals and railroads that just spiraled the Industrial Revolution forward. And 
if we want to use a historical example, the monarchies in both the Netherlands and England eventually stepped in and directly colonized Indonesia and South Asia, respectively. Netherlands colonized Indonesia, England colonized South Asia, including what we now know as India. In an effort to try and extinguish some of the chaos that was created by the Dutch and British East India Company. So companies had colonized it previously, but then you get countries stepping in and taking over to try and quell some of the, the, the uprisings that had started and to make sure that the flow of wealth coming from the colonies continued. So let's take a look at this map, and we'll start with asking, what type of map are we looking at, and at what scale are we analyzing this data? So take a moment, jot it down. Now, let's start by noticing that the British Isles are labeled as the, quote, cradle of the Industrial Revolution. Let's adjust that. Let's modify that. What vocabulary term could we substitute for cradle? Give you a moment to answer that. Now, the same set of locational criteria that were used for industrial zones in England also applied to mainland Europe. Sites had to be close to resources like coal fields, but they also had to be connected to ports by water, either canals or rivers. And continental Europe felt the impact of the Industrial Revolution first. But notice the impact of distance decay in terms of how long it took to diffuse that, those technological improvements. And essentially, the diffusion of the fruits of the Industrial Revolution globally occurred slowly and in three broad phases. During the first phase, which ran from roughly the mid-1700s, 1760 to the 1880s, the Industrial Revolution diffused to Belgium, the Netherlands, France, Germany, and a country we don't see on this slide, the United States. Now, as transportation systems improved, traditional wooden sailing ships gave way to steel ships that were powered by steam engines. And then later, railroads became more prevalent across the world as well. The United States began really rapid adoption of railroads around 1850. And half a century later, Japan, which was the first major non-Western nation to undergo full industrialization. And Japan industrializing was part of this second phase of the diffusion of industrial technology. And this spanned from years around 1880 to the mid-1900s, like 1950, just post-World War II, where the Industrial Revolution and industrial technology diffused to countries like Russia, Japan, Canada, along with other primarily Western places, especially British colonies and former British colonies. Now, during this time, some industrial centers began to develop in places that were still predominantly agricultural, including Shanghai in China, what was at the time known as Bombay in India, it's now known as Mumbai, Monterey in Mexico, and Sao Paulo, Brazil. And the third phase of the diffusion of industrialization and industrial technology began in the 1950s and is still underway and has seen the continued industrialization of countries that affected, were affected by phase two and the industrialization of places like Israel, which comes into existence after World War II uh, as a, a sovereign independent state, as well as several countries in and around the Pacific Ocean. And so it's important to note a couple of terms that we're going to hear throughout the course of the year. So the countries that are in phase three, those countries are industrializing. They're undergoing industrialization. So it's a process that is still taking place, industrializing. A lot of the countries in phase two are industrialized. They have undergone, undergone industrialization and they've made it through that process. 
right? And now a lot of those areas that were in phase one, those early industrial areas, have actually moved beyond industry and are what we classify as post-industrial. We'll talk about what that means in a later lecture, but I want to make sure that you hear those terms. Industrializing, countries that are still undergoing it. Industrialized, they've accomplished industrialization. They are industrial states. And then post-industrial, they've moved beyond it. We'll talk about that more. Now, as countries industrialized, we actually saw improvements in things like agriculture. And a couple of the examples that happened before and during the Industrial Revolution included things like four-field crop rotation, so rotating where you plant and, and having a, a system in place. Crop rotation existed before this, but the four-field system of crop rotation is associated with the, the second agricultural revolution, which takes place during the Industrial Revolution, and improved animal breeding techniques that led to increases in production. Now you combine that with the benefits of the Industrial Revolution, and we saw improvements in agriculture with inventions like the seed drill that we mentioned earlier from Jethro Tull, and things like the horse-drawn cultivator. And the agricultural output of England increased about three and a half times during this time period. Now, what this did is this led to many workers losing their farming jobs and moving to cities. And so even though industrial output, So, due to the Industrial Revolution, Europeans sought to try and capitalize on what we call economies of scale to try and generate greater profits. Now, essentially what economies of scale are is that when you mass produce a large number of something that is in high demand, the average cost per unit goes down for the manufacturer. So, you produce a lot of something, the cost per unit goes down. We call those economies of scale. Now, in addition to the fact that the cost to the manufacturer goes down, the price per unit for the consumer goes down as well. That's going to matter here in a minute. So by the early part of the 20th century, 1900s, a man named Henry Ford took another big step in advancing productivity by developing what we call the assembly line. A, a manufacturing process that's very efficient in which components are added in a sequential manner. In other words, an item is moved from worker to worker with each worker performing the same task over and over and over. And this became known as Fordism. And Fordism is sometimes contributed to a decline in skilled labor because you don't have to know how to do everything in building a car. You only need to know how to do one thing. So some have said that Fordism, the assembly line, led to a decline in skilled labor, but it became the dominant mode of mass production between 1945, just after World War II, and into the 1970s. And this period was also marked by a huge surge in mass consumption because the price per unit had declined due to those economies of scale that we talked about. And so for the first time, for example, 
customers were able to buy a car from the Henry Ford Company. Now, another consequence of Fordism is that it often reinforced the existence of a very strict social hierarchy between the workers and the managers. And some economists have said that the spread of Fordism, especially here in the United States, is closely associated with the rise of unions. Unions sought to try and protect workers in this rigid hierarchy that existed between the workers and the managers and owners. And other economists have said that Fordism contributed to the rise of multinational corporations as well. And we'll talk about that later on, on in the year. Now, two major developments contributed to uh, the, the decline in Fordism. The first was the energy crisis that took place during the 1970s, which led to increasing manufacturing and transportation costs. Another was improvements in computers and electronics which allowed factories through automation to begin to replace workers with machines. Now, to illustrate the impact of this, U.S. industrial output doubled between 1984 and 2015. Doubled the amount of stuff that was produced. But the industrial employment rate declined by one-third. So we produce double the stuff with a third less workers. And while machines can be very expensive to install, the machines oftentimes save money for the company over a long period of time. They can work in theory 24 hours a day without breaks, without vacations, and they produce consistent work. And the workers who don't lose their jobs are often retrained to do more than one job so that they can rotate amongst a variety of different positions throughout the day. And these changes in the production process constitute the basis of post-Fordism, something that we'll talk about later in the year. So to illustrate this, there's one final example to, to show the real-world impact of Fordism. And this is the River Rouge plant in Dearborn, Michigan that was part of Henry Ford's company. And this plant exemplified what we call vertical integration of production that was common during the Fordist period. Ford imported raw materials from coal to rubber to steel from around the world and handled everything in-house. And his goal was to achieve total self-sufficiency by owning, operating, and coordinating all the resources needed to produce a complete automobile. And this complex included a power plant, boat docks, and a railroad. And the example of this, again, the term that we use for this is vertical integration. And we'll talk about that some more throughout the year. Have a wonderful night, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow.